Gentlemen, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'll introduce myself and then pass the microphone to, to each of you so that you can introduce yourselves as well. First of all, I want to say I'm sorry, but my camera is not working right now for some reason, so you can't see me. Um, I know that that could be disappointing for some folks, but my name is Marty Moran. I'm with Trimble. I'm actually with the eBuilder portion of Trimble. So I've worked actually over the course of the last 35 years in construction and delivering technology to construction. I've been with Trimble uh, for five years and have been fortunate enough to work on our partner team, which means I work with organizations like AECOM and also agencies like the Northeast Texas Regional Mobility Authority in delivering digital solutions to help agencies, transit agencies in particular, deliver projects more efficiently on time and on budget. I wanted to hand the microphone first over to Andrew and let him take a moment to introduce himself. Andrew's with AECOM. I also should mention, uh, you can probably tell from the look on his face, Andrew's suffering from a COVID onslaught in his household, so he's quite busy. Uh, so let's be gentle uh, on him with questions. Andrew, go ahead. Hey, Marty, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Andrew Liu. Uh, I am the Director of Growth for Transportation in the Western United States for AECOM. So that region spans 31 states uh, from as far west as Hawaii all the way out to uh, Texas where Glenn is and a little bit beyond actually in, in Louisiana. So 31 states uh, representing all modes of transportation from highways, transit rail, ports marine to aviation. And uh, also I've done some work on the digital side as well in the past and, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Marty. And good to see you, Glenn. Absolutely. And Glenn, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Glenn Green. I'm the executive director of the Northeast Texas Regional Mobility Authority. Um, we are an organization that uh, provides uh, different type trans like transportation solution to the East Texas area. Um, we do own and operate and maintain a tow road. Um, it's a tow loop around the Tyler area. Um, I have a previous 35 years as, as with Texas Department of Transportation where I was in construction for many years and design for years and uh, then was ended up being district engineer um, in the East Texas area. Um, that's that's uh, really ab about it. Andrew, good to, good to meet you and visit with you. Andrew works for a a really large company that extends much further than we do. And uh, we actually do take advantage of some of the consultant services that AECOM provides. Terrific, terrific. So perhaps you have worked together on a project in the past or may get to in the future. So I did want to mention as Trimble, we've been really, really fortunate. We work with a number of tra transit agencies around, uh, around the world and in particular in North America. But, you know, some of the agencies I would describe as somewhat self-funded. So the MBTA up in the, the Boston area, uh, one of the oldest, maybe the oldest uh, transit agency in the country, been around for well over 100 years. Their uh, local train system and so forth utilize eBuilder across their enterprise. Other uh, agencies like Pennsylvania DOT has embarked on a couple of rapid bridge replacement programs and they've used uh, tools from Trimble in particular eBuilder to deliver those those projects. We work uh, down in your neck of the woods, Glenn, with uh, the CAP Metro Authority in Austin, which is, of course, a burgeoning area with lots of people moving into the area. And of course, trying to decide what to build, where to build, how to build it, how to pay for it and so forth. And then, of course, Andrew, I think I've mentioned to you in the past, we work with the uh, with the uh, California High Speed Rail Authority. And um, again, one of those projects that, you know, a lot of us transit uh, uh, nuts that, you know, pay attention to trains and so forth are really, uh, really hoping, you know, it takes place, really want to see it take place. And they're trying to figure out, you know, a number of complex uh, solutions to challenges and so forth and how to build high speed rail out in, uh, you know, that sector of the world. So as, uh, as Trimble, we've been very, very fortunate and I've been very fortunate to work on some of these projects. So Glenn, I wanted to turn it over to you for a little bit. You and I had a chance to discuss a, a most, if not all of your funding historically has come from local ridership and so forth, but it sounds like you've had some opportunities to apply for monies 
from outside sources, some grant sources, government sources, and so forth. And I'm just wondering, you know, what that looks like to you. Do you see that changing in the future? Do you see the agency reaching out uh, to find additional funding and so forth? So absolutely. We want to take advantage of all the different funding opportunities that we can. Um, you are correct that we are somewhat self-funded. The regional mobility authorities in Texas, um, they're a, what is referred to as a quasi-state governmental entity. Um, we, we are put in place to serve more than just highways. We can um, engage in transit projects, in highways, in airports, in uh, railroads, um, all of which we've done so far except, uh, except the transit area. Um, our density of population really in our area doesn't lend itself to that near as much as uh, like Los Angeles where Andrew is. Um, <clears throat> so we received no state funding, no federal funding. Um, we uh, generate revenue from our toll facilities um, and we are self-supportive. Um, however, we the biggest point about what we do in Northeast Texas with a regional mobility authority is us, is we have a, a large area of, of several counties and uh, we, we take some of our revenue and we actually go to um, the local county judges every year with uh, different type project calls where uh, if they've got some small smaller projects that we they don't really have a funding stream to do or it doesn't fit one of their funding streams um, they can apply and we we actually can go and have done so uh, design constructed and uh, you know giving them a, a, a way to to uh, obtain some of these projects um, so examples are we've done a, a, a relife or rehab of our private rail facility in one area um, we've uh, furnish grant money to build a uh, airport hangar and mm. some taxiways and different things. Um, we have all kinds of funding tools available to us. We we can we we have bonding authority. Um, we have some revenue bonds in action right now. We have all kinds of different ways to uh, fund things as long as we have a way to pay them back. That's why one of the deals is a revenue. Projects that can generate revenue are big to us. We are taking advantage of uh, applying for uh, the Rural Surface Transportation Grant Program that is currently out um, of the infrastructure. Uh, one, of, one of the many infrastructure grant programs that's out, and we, uh, if we're successful, we intend to expand our current. Um, tollway loop facility in, in, in Tyler. We just turned that in last week and that's my understanding. We'll find out um, if we're awarded that uh, in the fall. Interesting. So how many projects do you folks consider in the course of a year or life cycle, if you will? Well, we really, that's a good question. We could, we, it seems like we could we have different things come up with our areas probably every other week. So it's hard to put a number. These are smaller projects. Um, so there's, you know, anywhere from uh, 30 to 40 smaller projects. Um, and, and then really what it comes down to is the projects that we can actually implement, design, build, construct, uh, comes down to elimination of, of how much funding that we have available at the time. Balancing the money against the, the need. Great. Right. So we do generally three to four uh, fairly, you know, not large in terms of Los Angeles type projects, but uh, smaller local uh, projects like the one I described. We do three or four of those a year, although we even do uh, or participate in helping our local communities find solutions to even some smaller pro problems in their in their hometowns. And that's ongoing all the time. 
And so I'm guessing prioritization of those projects is always a, always a big issue, always something that you folks are, are discussing, uh, debating, analyzing, and so forth. Yes, priority. And, and a lot of things are problems that have been around years. And what we work to do, one of the things we're successful at is, is some projects we go in and, and fund uh, 100%, um, but, but our uh, kind of the direction we, the gap that we filled in transportation in East Texas is we put different uh, stakeholders together. If the county has um, some funds, the city, um, the State Department of Transportation, we, we end up um, putting together packages where it's a uh, community type, more of a group effort um, to get a project to fruition. Terrific. And, and uh, last question before I move over to Andrew, how bad does it hurt that Andrew's team represents the uh, NFL uh, championship and uh, the Cowboys are just, all right, we'll get back to that later. Okay. I'll give you a break. <laughs> that, that hurts bad. That hurts bad, but we've got something for you in the future. I would have uh, expected nothing less. Andrew, tell, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, IIJA means to a company like AECOM, right? Very, very global company a, a, across the world, delivering many, many types of projects in particular in transportation and transit and how much opportunity um, you know, do you expect this to bring to organizations like yours and, and agencies like uh, like Glenn's? And, you know, when is this stuff going to start landing? Right. So we, we've heard about this, you know, this <clears throat> allocate, if you will, of, of dollars coming. And a lot of us are still a little bit confused about how that stuff gets meted out and so forth. Sure. Uh, thanks, Marty. And, and uh, Glenn, I, I will just say, you know, that. You know this whole NFL question that, that, that you know we we do deserve a little bit of uh, football love music considering I did not have a football <laughs> team my entire childhood almost uh, uh, for the past twenty or years or so. Um, so Marty IJ, great question. I get asked this question quite a bit. You know, as the person who heads up growth and business development for Acom uh, in the Western U.S. Um, and, and you know, you mentioned it's global. Uh, we are a global company, so obviously it is. Uh, only part of our business that sees uh, a lot of the impact from this IJA. That said, uh, I think the uh, our what our our U.S. Uh, comprises of two of the seven uh, regions in in the ACOM, and those are the two largest regions for us. So it is a pretty big impact. If you really look at it, people on the transportation side, uh, you know, one two trillion dollars, you know, or five years, a lot of money. Um, but if you look at it, actually, uh, uh, probably a little bit more than half of that is actually uh, primarily a reauthorization of the FAST Act. So the actual roughly maybe half a billion dollars or so comes down to actual new spending. And from that new spending, maybe another half of that, like around 250 or so, a billion, is dedicated towards transportation. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, I do cover all the modes, uh, highways, transit, aviation, ports. Uh, and for us, you know, we really seen quite a bit of, you know, as far as following the money, it, you know, really a lot on the highways is a big part of it. That probably has the biggest trend. You look at, uh, you know, passenger freight wells, uh, probably the next biggest, uh, uh, next biggest chunk with about 65 billion or so. Um, but, you know, there's definitely some interesting trends that we're seeing too, that, you know, I think this IJ brings opportunity. Uh, you know, I, I would say overarchingly, you're seeing a lot more themes around it of, uh, you know, more resilience in our infrastructure, uh, thinking about projects that have more efficient mobility for both people and goods, social equity, environmental sustainability, so on and so forth. So these, there's elements of that that have to be thought of in all the different programs now. Um, in addition, I think there's some interesting things uh, just for, uh, you know, from looking at it from, I think, transportation in the years to come, we're going to have to start thinking about the nexus between transportation and other uh, industries such as energy or even uh, telecoms data, right? So if you look at just the IJ itself, you know, there is a there is a significant amount of money that's going into the power on the grid that's going to, su uh, that's going to support the electrification of our transportation, be it through electric vehicles, uh, rail electrifications, uh, et cetera. 
Also, there's a huge part of it, which is broadband. So a lot of people don't think about that as a transportation, but I like to think of, you know, uh, transportation of the movement of people and goods, and probably we should be recategorizing as a movement of people, goods, and data, right? So um, if you really if you really look at it from an infrastructure perspective, what is what is the best place to lay down broadband uh, and all the uh, fiber connectivity is probably along these uh, the highways that we have today, which are basically the trunks. Uh, for the road network, which probably mirror a lot of the communications network as well. So I've seen a lot of, you know, states like out here in California, Caltrans is really have quite a few opportunities, programs coming out, uh, looking at, you know, now. So really thinking about from our perspective as civil transportation engineers now thinking about uh, new technologies as well, what's going to enable. A lot of these are also going to enable the future of mobility as well when it comes to things like, uh, you know, having, uh, having the vehicle to infrastructure type of communication, having the connectivity there. So those are all a lot of big opportunities, five years, a lot of time, a uh, short amount of time for a lot of money. That said, um, I would say where it's really, when, when we will see the impact to answer your question is that probably, I would say a little bit more so in, in 2023, you know, this year has been a lot of, uh, you know, the different agencies, I'm sure Glenn and his organization have been looking at it as well in terms of understanding the bill, what the grant out opportunities are. In ACOM, we, do, we are helping quite a few clients prepare some grants. Uh, we've, we've done that quite a bit in the past. So, you know, we're very optimistic. And uh, I think IJ is gonna bring a uh, really good half decade of a lot of solid infrastructure work for the whole community. Terrific. And it, it sounds like the thought processes are much more holistic than they used to be, right? Um, it, it maybe was, we need a road to get people from point A to point B in the past. And today we have to think in a much broader context, of course, what's there today, what are the right of ways and, and, and all of those issues. And certainly that, you know, that's impactful in a place like Los Angeles, or I happen to be in the Chicagoland area. There are not many places to build new infrastructure in, in, in established places. But Glenn, when we look at your neighborhood, and uh, you know, I'm wondering if, if you're confronting some of the same issues that, that holistic nature of projects and so forth and and having to think more broadly in terms of what you're delivering to your, your constituents well we, we we certainly are we're we're kind of a young organization um so um we're we're just at the kind of the beginning um beginning part of discovering all the different things that um, we can do part of our challenge is uh, identifying and finding out uh, for more of a holistic approach you know what is what is most needed and and what the priorities are to um, really help our local communities and uh, make a difference make an impact to the uh, mainly the, the the traveling public for the highways at least is our is our focus right now makes makes perfect sense i'm gonna i'm gonna ask this question of both of you andrew i'm gonna start with you um for those of us that pay attention to construction we see just a a, a huge amount of an array of projects that need to be delivered right from existing infrastructure bridges and and roadways and so forth rail uh airports uh the traveling public right we're, we're seeing airports uh transforming you know, as we travel through them over the course of the last number of years and so forth. But what do you see as some of the, the um, are, are some of the biggest challenges in delivering projects today and going forward, given that, you know, perhaps money's less of an obstacle, right? Sure. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think definitely, Marty, there's, I mean, there's lots of obvious Obviously, there's lots of challenges to delivering complex programs, but if I had to, you know, pick one at the top of the list, I would say it's people, right? The lack lack of it. Um, you know, I I think our our industry has already historically had some challenges, um, you know, and the you know the recent pandemic and the Great Resignation has certainly not helped it. Um, you know, I would say there definitely is you know just amongst ACOM and our competitors or the construction industry, there definitely is a bit of a war for talent going on. Um, not enough people mm -hmm. out there to deliver the uh, opportunities that I have, that we have out there, right? So, 
Um, you, you know, really people uh, bringing new people into the field, getting them, uh, getting them trained up, giving them opportunities to learn. And we really see kind of a generation that's retiring with a bit of a gap in succession planning. So uh, I attribute that uh, a large part of that to you look at what happened maybe 20, 30, uh, 20 plus years ago uh, with the dot com industry. And I think I'm a perfect example of that. You know, somebody who has roughly 25 years of experience. Well, my my peer group when I was in school, everybody wanted to go become a you know software engineer and become a dot com uh, millionaire, right? So I guess nowadays mm -hmm. it's billionaires. Um, so you really see there's a lot of people who just were moving away from the civil construction industry, and now we're kind of caught in this in this uh, era and time where. You know this this uh, this generation, which should be coming on, taking the you know the the leadership roles, whether it be corporate leadership or project leadership, and there's just not enough of them. It, you have a good pool of people uh, coming up behind us, but a lot of them don't have that same experience. So really, try, I think the the people issue is a is a, a pretty big part of it. And like, like I said, I think part of that structurally um, was you know just this gap that we saw 20 plus years ago. Um, for people that are not getting into civil, and that has been exacerbated quite a bit these days by, uh, you know, just uh, people's, uh, you know, demand for, you know, their propensity towards having more flexible work-life balance. You know, people just rethinking and people just uh, leaving the industry altogether. So that's a, that is the biggest challenge I see as a leader at AECOM that we're, and I think all my peers at other companies probably are facing today. Sure, sure. Very much a common theme that uh, we find ourselves meeting about. It seems like every week now, right? Glenn, are, are you seeing some of the same same things locally and uh, facing some of the same challenges? Well, not, I, our, the challenges we see from our perspective are a little bit different than, than Andrew. We, Since we're the ones that are actually um, developing, constructing, and, and uh, putting projects on the ground, the, the major projects are larger, right? So you have to clear them environmentally, and as part of that process, um, you have public involvement. So the biggest challenge we run into on our projects, especially or mainly our new location projects, is uh, unified community support. Um, everyone, you know, different people have different viewpoints of the best solution, whether it's highway transit or some other type of transportation facility. And, and then uh, what's even more of a sticking point is, okay, exactly where is it gonna go? So we have different corridors in our area where we have identified needs to provide a, a highway or some sort of traffic facility. And uh, it's very, very difficult to get everyone on board and supportive as far as community of exactly the type project you you're going to deliver and exactly where it's going to go so not only is it the community and the stakeholders you know it's your electeds we we have to work closely with all our elected officials and of course they represent the community but at the same time um, you know, everyone has different interests. So as part of making a project successful, you got to have everybody pushing the same way so you can take advantage of different sources of funding um, and you can clear it environmentally and uh, get a successful record of decision. And, uh, you know, we, we lean heavily on our consultant partners um, like Andrew with AECOM. Um, we, we have some other uh, consultant partners in, in Northeast Texas that we lean on and they had, we, we lean on them heavily to help us navigate and garner community support and work through those issues. Um, it seems like once we get the project cleared and the big part of the decisions made, it, it, it gets easier. Um, but community support is the, is the biggest opposition that, that, uh, that I really see here and you know part of it is simply because you know land is becoming more valuable and uh, there's only so much of it and when you're out of a new location you're going across somebody's piece of land and I can sympathize with them and understand you know they 
they may not want a highway or a transportation facility on it, um, but we've got to do something to um, help freight and help mobility in the area to get people around because our highways are to the point to where you can only expand so much, as I'm sure Andrew is bumping up against in Los Angeles all the time. You can only expand so much, and you've got to widen out at some point to furnish uh, a way to get from here to there. Sure, I think uh, you know the term "not in my backyard" has become kind of a kind of a catchphrase, right? But there are legitimate exactly. concerns in every community, um, right? Do I want that highway next to my you know condominium? Probably not. Um, but what is you know what is the alternative? Fun stuff to fun stuff to navigate. I wanted to um, Andrew just ask you you know what have you seen thus far? Um, with respect to IIJA and government funding, have, have you got any kind of real world examples of, you know, where we're starting to see action taking place, you know, grants being written, um, potential projects being identified and so forth, uh, you know, before our very eyes? Um, yeah, you know, I think, uh, Marty, I mean, there's like a couple different um, uh, grant mechanisms uh, raise grant is one of those that I think, uh, or one of the first ones I think that were out, uh, out the door. Um, and these are for some of these, uh, you know, mega projects that would focus on sustainability, equitability. And I, I believe the first round of applications already went in, you know, there's certainly, we see a lot of, um, these big specific, uh, there's a whole category for the, uh, uh, bridge improvements as well. We see things like the Brent Spence bridge is one of those that you know uh we we've heard uh, along all along the way uh as the ij was being formed as one of those major uh infrastructure uh, uh that, that needed to be fixed so we we definitely have seen quite a bit that quite a bit of that and again like i said this year has been a lot of a lot of you know us sitting with some of our customers thinking about you know, what is the strategy, uh, you know, it's helping them screen what kind of projects that are developing some kind of grant strategy, even in cases, in some cases, helping prepare the, uh, helping prepare the uh, grant applications have not gotten quite to the point where actually administering those contracts, uh, grants quite yet. So I think that'll probably come around more so um, next year, if you will. Makes sense. And, and Glenn, have you seen any evidence of um, folks within your agency queuing up and getting ready to uh, to make applications? Um, yes, and, and you know, the Net RMA, that entity I currently uh, work with, um, as I mentioned before, we just made application for the Rural Surface Transportation Grant as was one of the ones following the group that Andrew just mentioned. Um, and so, that application is, is not simple. It's very in depth. Um, there's a benefit cost analysis that goes with each one of them to weigh the cost against the benefit of the numbers of people that you're going to help. Um, ours came out uh, with a pretty good number, so we're very hopeful. Um, <clears throat> but it is an in depth analysis type of application um, that you have to submit that companies that we used to allow. Uh, a, a company that's big in East Texas, HNTB, put our put our package together. Um, as as I think they're one of the ones along with AECOM that does the same thing. Um, they're big in the Northeast and they have the expertise on demonstrating the benefits in that application and focusing on something that we think can be successful to obtain a grant that'll be really beneficial to our local area and our local transportation needs. Sure, sure, makes sense. Let's let's turn our attention, Andrew, towards uh, digital, the digital component of um, IIJA, and you know, an area of particular interest to those of us at Trimble, and I'm guessing you folks as well. What have you seen, or what do you see ahead? You know, with digital opportunities in in terms of um, maybe I'll use the term. Mm -hmm. Group, the things we can get our hands on today and, and start bringing projects together more efficiently, uh, more accurately, and so forth. Yeah, um, great question, Marty. I think um, it, I think it's a little bit binary in my uh, in my opinion. I think number one is I, I mentioned broadband, right, which is huge, sixty five billion dollars for broadband across the country. 
you know, that comes third after uh, 110 billion, it was for roads and bridges and major projects and 65 billion or so for passenger freight rail. So you're seeing as much dedicated to broadband uh, as it is for freight law, which is a large part of what Glenn was talking about too, right? The importance of really, you know, thinking about how do we make uh, goods movement more efficient, which has all kinds of implications on from sustainability perspective, from a traffic perspective, so on and so forth. Um, so that, that I think is really great. On the other side of it, I would say, if you're looking at deployment of technology, they're pretty large numbers for a, from a technology perspective, but um, nowhere near the same amounts as you are when you're looking at the traditional infrastructure, right? So I can think a couple of examples, I think about for roads and bridges, there's probably about a hundred million dollars or so uh, dedicated to digital construction technology. So, you know, Marty, you and I, we've talked about this in the past uh, from, a, you know, things like, uh, uh, you know, some of the things that Trimble has like with Quadri, you know, you know IoT platforms, uh, 3D modeling, all these different types of things, the digital e-builder, great example, digital PM, getting more of that implemented into, uh, into the road and bridges side. Um, there's also the other part of that, which is a large part of the traffic management. So it's probably about half a billion dollars for smart grants, which is right. uh, strengthening mobility and revolutionizing transportation. So it's a lot of traffic monitoring, advanced transportation and management systems, ITS systems. So you're seeing a lot of that. I think that's that's really great to see. I think, uh, you know, over the years, we've seen more and more deployments of newer technologies. Uh, DSRC, VDX type of application. So really great to see more funding going towards that. And then of course, I think, you know, even places like aviation, you're seeing quite a bit of the, you know, there's about $25 billion for airports. And a lot of that is for improving things like air traffic control technology. So really updating some of the existing systems that we have. So <clears throat> a good amount of money. I think there's always, you know, uh, uh, technology is one of those areas. I think it's still emerging. Um, it is a it is a uh, 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 era that I'm very enthusiastic as as you know I, I chaired the the emerging technologies committee for ITS America so really it is about how do we start to take some move from these pilot projects onto broader scale implementation and definitely see IJA as being one source of helping accelerate <clears throat> some of that towards the future. Thank you for for bringing that up, right? So so broadband and traffic controls, things that we maybe don't think about when we think about infrastructure spend, we, maybe not instinctively, right? But that are so critical in how we move people, how we move data, how we move information and so forth going forward. And really a big, big portion of it. Glenn, I'm gonna pick on you a little bit in your agency. I'm just wondering, it's 2022, we're halfway, almost halfway through the year, right? How are you folks delivering projects today more efficiently, better than maybe you did five years ago or 10 years ago? Or, um, you know, kind of a call out here, are you still largely a paper and Excel spreadsheet type of, of agency at this point in time? Well, that's a, that's a really good, good question. Um, our staff is relatively small, so um, we don't really have... Uh, the the latest capabilities we we are more of the implementer and uh we we really lean on our consultant partners to be the ones that uh help us and they're the ones that help with the uh, the new digital era uh, make things more efficient pull, pull things together more efficient they work for us we pay them we have some general engineering consultants that are on board at all times working on our projects. So um, we're really a little bit outside of, of, of the use of the latest techniques, but our consultant partners, um, such as what Andrew works for, are the ones that really are leading the way and leading the charge on that. Um, we, we do do a lot of our meetings with a, um, you know, Zoom meetings to save time and uh, save, save costs we do that extensively we you know we've tooled up different conference room facilities with a full led wall board to to, to be able to communicate uh across the state where we can't just get to the different places we need to be all the time sure sure and, and what you're pointing out is really i think important it, it's not always the the 
core organization, the agency itself, it, it's often bringing more efficiencies through the, the consulting groups you work with and so forth, right? And, and as opposed to building up that infrastructure internally, um, really turn to the experts and turn to the professionals that do this every day, right? Absolutely. Not a thing wrong with that at all. Andrew, we're getting close to the end here. Can you share? Uh, I, I always like anecdote stories and I, I sure. tend to lean towards success stories, but you know, sometimes you know, there's stories on the other side of the equation too. Um, so I'm going to leave it, leave it to you to kind of, kind of pick an, an anecdotal story of a project that you've been on that you would say was, you know, incredibly successful because of technology or, you know, maybe the opposite. Maybe there were some challenges that technology could have, could have uh, helped with. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to maybe change my answer up a little bit, Marty. I'm going to talk about technology application, but try to tie it to my last comment about the amount of funding there is, and also about sure. and to Glenn's comment about you know the role of the agency, um, and so despite everything that I just said about okay, it's great, and I wish you know there were more money for technology. I would say technology doesn't have to be that complicated, and sometimes just the smallest solutions can actually save quite a bit. So as Glenn was speaking, I kind of it reminded me of uh, one thing that um, some of my colleagues uh, at Acom in Australia had started off years ago. And they, they basically developed the program and they digitized the whole process, which is equivalent to our EIR, EIS process here in, in the States. And so rather than, you know, for the, I, I still remember for the demo that they gave, they came in and they brought in uh, to, you know, to our, to our chief executives, a stack of binders saying, this is all the paper that we need to do to print out <laughs> all the environmental documents for this one project that we're going to do. We, you know, they're just a group of engineers. They built the software, um, they call it Plan Engage, and really they come and now they digitize that whole thing. Uh, not only just to save uh, paper, but at the end of the day, it makes it more efficient. It's map space, so you could actually have an interactive map. You could go in there, you could click on a specific parcel or community and see what are the impacts from due to the project. You could have a member of the public come in and leave comments. And I'm sure we've all gone through the hundreds if not thousands of comments from the public that come in and probably 30 or 40 of them are the same comment. So, you know, they, they, they're, they built in and put in some uh, artificial intelligence to try to consolidate that to see if these are all the same comments. So at the end of the day, it really makes it much more, you know, efficient. It makes it, uh, you know, a digitally deliverable uh, product. So uh, it's very difficult if you think about from a member of the public to go say, I'm going to go online and download, you know, chapter chapter 35 here of a PDF document versus, hey, I'm going to go on the map, click to see what I'm interested in and see how it's going to be an impact. And so, you know, that's a very simple application. It's probably something that, uh, uh, you know, ACOM has tried to productize and, and, uh, and uh, either either implement for their clients or make it to the point where they uh, they can do it themselves. So it's a very simple fix. It's not expensive at all. And doesn't, uh, you know, so so I kind of, I guess I'll, I, I give this anecdote because Marty, I'll, I think about my last comment from an IJ perspective, how much funding there is, what Glenn mentioned. A lot of times the technology is simple, the sweet and simple is better than, you know, something very, very futuristic or very uh, complicated, I would say. Yeah, I think um, most of us are what I would describe as incrementalists, right? Gaining those small um, you know, factors of efficiency and so forth through simple technologies, and the aggregated you know value of that over over you know many of those and over time really really add up. That's terrific, Glenn. I want to give you just a moment um, to think about some projects you folks have delivered over the course of the last number of years, and maybe kind of brag a little bit about something you've been able to deliver to your communities or constituents, a specific project that has made a difference in the community? Well, there's, there's, there's several of them. Um, I keep that was going pretty back. mean, right? I asked you to mention one. <laughs> yeah. I keep going back to our, our current toll facility, at least in our area, we were one of the first ones uh, in the East Texas area to deliver a fully electronic toll facility where there's there's no toll booths there's nothing like that we're all uh, video cameras uh, whether that gets a picture of your license plate and does an automatic bill or we, we use toll tags and transponders and so we were we were one of the first at least with the RMAs to implement a totally electronic system 
The one thing I did want to mention is that we do have an opportunity to develop another facility that we're looking at and evaluating, and we're in the very infancy of uh, developing this project. But one of the things we are looking into is to put in some infrastructure um, in the construction phase when the when the uh, during the time frame when the cost is much less to do it in the initial construction than it would be to add later, but the infrastructure to put in some of the technology for the future of, of the possibility of autonomous driving and autonomous cars and, and uh, being able to have that those different things, um, not necessarily exactly what all it's going to do with them, but to have uh, the infrastructure built in the roadway to, uh, you know, make it easier to add that technology, what it, whatever it may turn out to be in the future. And that's about a 30-mile-long project. I kind of view it as a, a good pilot project for somebody big and smart like, a, like AECOM to come uh, help us with our technology with. Terrific. It, it's kind of funny we ask about projects and technology finds its way you know, end up, end up virtually everything we do today. Andrew, I'm going to give you almost the last word here. If there were one thing you could share about AECOM, you know, with Glenn or other agencies, you know, how, how can your firm assist organizations with IIJA? You know, what are some of the things that you guys bring to the table? Sure. Yeah. No, I think uh, we, I touched on a little bit uh, earlier and, you know, of course, Glenn, Glenn mentioned uh, they had, uh, they had done some work as well with some other, uh, with some other companies, but just, you know, at the end of the day, if uh, Glenn or any other agencies, you just need some help thinking about, you know, just from a strategy perspective or, or identifying potential opportunities, you know, we're, we're happy to help. We can do everything, like I said, from that upfront work to preparing applications to even helping administer. We have a national infrastructure economics practice. And, and, you know, to me, I like to kind of say that, you know, that's for us, that's not our bread and butter work. So, you know, if it's not a very extremely complicated one, we could also definitely work with you on, you know, making sure that that's something that's uh, uh, oftentimes for myself as a person who's heading up this development growth that we would look at as, uh, as uh, you know, just helping the agency out as opposed to some kind of, uh, uh, you know, paid engagement. And so we're definitely, you know, uh, love to have that conversation and happy to happy to help wherever we can. So. I mentioned almost the last word since I, I allowed Andrew to give you a little commercial there, Glenn. Um, I want your prediction. Uh, certainly Super Bowls happen every year. Who's going to win the next Super Bowl? Wow, that's that that that's that's a loaded question. <laughs> I, I don't think, although I hate to admit it, I don't think Dallas is quite ready. Um, so. Uh, um, I think I think California is going to have a, a huge contender, and I, my my prediction is that Buffalo will be in it also. Look at you! How magnanimous was that? Um, I expected that you know that strong cowboy pull, but uh, I'm sure we'll see them again. Gentlemen, you've been great. Thank you so much uh, for your content today and for participating. Andrew, get back to your COVID patients in the house. I'm hoping everybody will get better. Glenn, get back to work. There's still plenty of daylight down in Texas, right? We can get some things done today and uh, enjoy the rest of the event. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great to talk to you guys. See you, Glenn. Bye, Marty. Thank you.